Welcome to another episode of the Go With John Show. I'm John Jorgensen, and today we have my mom, Lillian Jorgensen, back in the studio with us. Welcome, Lillian. Good morning. Welcome. Thank good you. Good morning. Are you awake? Yes, I'm awake. <laughs> That's good. All right. So last time you were here, we spoke a little bit about the overall process of, of uh, listing your home and selling your home, and then we kind of dug our teeth into staging a little bit and what you need to do to get the home ready to sell. Yeah. So so today, so once you get your home staged and you're ready to list it, what happens uh, in the process? Well, we get the house listed. And of course, you can list it in a couple of different ways. You can list it coming soon. Uh, which gives uh, everybody a chance to kind of see the home um, on the uh, website. On MLS, you can drive by and see the neighborhood before it actually goes on the market and decide if you want to go in and see it. Or you can go cold turkey and just list the home and it pops up for everybody to see and then uh, they'll make an appointment to come show. Right. So what are the pros and cons of listing coming soon? Do you like to do coming soon or do you prefer to just list your homes? Well, there are pros and cons. There's a lot of controversy about the coming soon. And we have people who want to see it. We cannot show it. Right. We have to explain to the sellers that we cannot show the home while it's coming soon. And when you explain that whole process, then often the seller says, well, let's just go. Right. So people, we're ready. Let's right. just get it on the market and so why, we can show. Why can't you show it when it's coming soon? What prevents you? That's against the law. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, it's, it's against, is it against... MLS policy. Well, yeah, but I mean, that is the law within NVAR that you right. cannot show a home at all during uh, coming soon. And then we have the buyers that actually analyze everything on the website, write a contract sight unseen in the coming soon stages. Right. And then all of a sudden, the status is changed from coming soon to pending. And buyers who would like to see this home, who's driven by, who decided, this is the home for me, didn't even have a chance to see it because it's gone. Right, right. And so for that reason, often I think that unless the seller really want to be coming soon, I like to just list the house for everybody to have the same chance to see it and write on it. Right. Now that makes right perfect away. sense. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you get the, you get the home listed and, uh, you're in the MLS, then what happens, uh, next? Well, we then of course have the showings mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> there are different ways, uh, to show the home. It can be scheduled online for appointments or you as the agent can take the appointments and talk to the agent. So we can divide into two groups. I would say when you're in the high-end market, um, I like to talk with the agent. So I am the showing contact right. to get in to see the house and I'll be there as well to show the house and open up. And that's what most homeowners like when they're in the, uh, let's say over two, $3 million. Right. Uh, Anything below that, uh -huh. we schedule online. You have your showing sh slot and you bring the buyers in for a 15, 20 minute uh, showing. And hopefully there'll be lots of activity right away. Mm -hmm. And then contracts can be um, looked at as they come in and we send them to, usually we'll send them to the seller so they can look at the contract. And um, we will have a contract deadline mm -hmm. normally. And if you don't put a contract deadline in the MLS, we start getting the calls when our contracts do, and we get all these questions. So in the market we've been in for the last year, I think most of us feel we need a deadline. Right. So everybody knows what is going on. Then again, we have had buyers that write a fantastic offer it is presented to the seller and he says, I like it, let's just be done. I'm sick and tired of showing my home. And then out the window goes the deadline and then you have all these unhappy buyers who thought there was a contract deadline. Mm -hmm. And again, they didn't even have a chance to uh, see it and write on it. Right, and I think the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, the seller and the buyer can really do whatever they want. 
you know, we as yeah. agents are in between and you sit down with a seller and you have a um, offer deadline, but the seller is allowed to change their mind. Oh, absolutely. We yeah. work for the seller. It is in the sole discretion of the seller. And sometimes sellers don't realize what it all means with showings. And they have to leave home. They're practically gone for days and days because people are coming into the home all the time. Right. And all of a sudden, enough is enough. I've had it. Yep. We have a good contract. It's more than we expected. Let's just take it. Right. Right. So, um, yeah. 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 And just, you know, buyers can change their mind, too. Yeah. You know, it's a, a buyer can write an offer on a house. And before it's ratified, the buyer can withdraw the offer. So, yeah, that's right. you know, and that's I think that's one of the things that maybe makes people a little crazy in the uh, real estate world is yeah. that we're all humans and we're all dealing with humans and uh, and, and things kind of change a little bit along the way. Yeah. So so when you when you sh so you sh you list the home, you show the home and then you get offers in. Now, now we're we're in a transitional point in the market. I feel a lot of people yeah. uh, believe this. So we're 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 having this conversation in May of 2022, yeah. and really things over the last two three weeks have just started to change. So it's yeah. difficult to. Um, yep. you know, have Generalize. this conversation that's going to, that's yep. going to live, uh, on, on, on the yep. podcast. Six months from now. Could be a totally different story. totally different. Right. Yep. So let's just pretend for a moment that it's a, a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. So then what happens when you list a home? Cause you've been through multiple right. cycles of extreme seller's markets. You've been yeah. through multiple cycles of extreme buyer's markets. So yeah. what happens in a buyer's market with showings? Well, everything is definitely a lot more relaxed and, and with ease and uh, everybody takes their time. You don't, you get a, a you know, three or four showings a week. Yeah. And, um, and then again, then week after week after week. And then finally, maybe after a month or two, uh, you get an offer, and some sellers will then say, well, this is really not what I want. Let's wait a while. And I know we Asians are always saying your first offer, if we, if we know it's reasonable, will be your best offer because the longer you're on the market, the more you're going to get negotiated. Right. Because why isn't your house selling? Um, it should have sold. It's perfect. Why isn't it selling? The price is obviously wrong. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then they come in with offers. Sellers don't like the offer. And sometimes they'll wait for the next one, who will, which will be less. Right. Yeah. And, and, and we've seen it. We've seen oh, yeah. the seller who... I'll just make up a number. Sliding down with the market. Right. Behind the curve. Yeah, right. You absolutely. have a house listed for a million and maybe it should have been listed for nine fifty. They get an offer for nine fifty. They don't like it. The um, house sits on the market. Maybe then he drops the price to nine fifty yeah. two and months later. Now and now you get an down. offer for nine hundred, right? Yeah. And we call that being behind the curve, yeah, right? The prices right. are curving down and the sellers dropping their price too slowly and they're just sitting right behind the curve yeah. not yeah. not selling their home and in and it's really interesting when you're in such a in, in fact there's a lot of agents that are real estate agents today that have never seen no, a buyer's market they don't market. know what they it's like well, oh my goodness they have no idea but yeah. that's okay then they go at it with a different angle and right. that's good too right, right and they'll right. learn they'll, yes. they'll see it <laughs> they one day too will be having 30 years behind them as well exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's funny on some of the uh, Facebook uh, groups that I'm on that uh, um, the agents are saying their sellers are upset because they've been on the market for two weeks and they don't have an offer yet. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those it's, were the days. Yeah, yeah. So, OK. So so we've talked a little bit about the seller's market, the buyer's market. We're probably moving into more of a normal market now where sellers are going to list their home. Buyers are going to have a chance to go look at two or three, four homes. They're not going to have to write the offer the second they see a house. It looks like things are normalizing a little bit, but we don't know. Right. No, it can go either know. way. Yeah. It could go either way. But let's just say also getting the contract, as we explain to our sellers when we are taking the listing, they have hired us to do a job and hopefully the sellers will listen to us 
and take our advice along the way. But then right. getting that contract finally, whether it's one day or five days or a month, that's only 50% of the job. Now we've got to hold it together. And then right. the market we are in right now here in May, I mean, March, April, May, we are seeing buyer's remorse within 24 hours. Right. And you can't rest on your laws. And in neighborhoods with HOAs and condo associations, we are finding that buyers, well, I can cancel the contract on the HOA or condo docs. Right. And there you are. This happened to me twice in the last two months. And of course, sellers are devastated because the computer got changed, showing we had an offer. Then when you get the back on the market, get the next offer, everybody is questioning what happened. Well, nothing happened except there's nothing wrong. But the buyers change their minds. Right. There's yep. so few opportunities to buy that they jump at the next property thinking, this is what I want and I want to get it now. And then they sleep on it and they're sorry. So this is a very frustrating market. It is a market unlike any that I have seen in my mm -hmm. 37 years in the business. And we think every day we can see something that we haven't already experienced. Right. But this frenzy, and where is all this money coming from? It is amazing. Just two or three years ago, we were fighting over a $5,000 or $2,000 counter offer in a contract more than a million dollars. Right. Today, they throw another $100,000 on top of the listing price plus escalation after that, it's like money is endless. Right. And this is really a scary sign yeah. because where is this going to end? Right, right. There'll be one day when these houses have to sell again. Yep. And where's the market then? Exactly. I think the future, of course, is unknowable, but it's going to be a very different future than we have ever seen in our whole economy. Right, right. Because this is countrywide. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, so uh, w once you, so you, so you asked about, uh, or you asked, you spoke about um, getting the contract ratified and then you have to hold it together. So there's a, there's a lot of things that can happen during the, uh, the contract phase. So yeah. let's take a, uh, let's take a quick break and uh, we've got to get an ad in from uh, one of our sponsors and uh, we will be right back on the other side of the break with more from Lillian Jorgensen. Good. I'm John Jorgensen, and if you want to learn more about buying a home or selling your existing home, contact us through the show. We work with an incredible network of professionals who can help you get through the process smoothly. Again, that's GoWithJohn.com. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're still here in the studio with Lillian, my mom. Welcome. Thank you. So, so uh, thank you for that great uh, description of uh, what happens when you list your home. That's really uh, interesting information. So, tell us about fielding contracts, getting a property under contract, and from from a listing agent's perspective, what happens and how? What do you do? Well, most of the time we get multiple contracts, and of course we have to make it easy for the sellers to understand. Oh, and by the way, I've always gone through the contract with my sellers uh, when I do uh, the, uh, well, not right at the taking of the listing, but at some time into the listing period, I will meet with the sellers and go through the contract. So when it comes in, they are familiar with the terminology and have an idea of what we have to look for, what paragraphs are important, so we don't have to spend so much time explaining the actual contract. Right. So what happens is, let's say you have six contracts, you can't look through, you know, six contracts with 25 pieces of paper on each one. Right. So I highlight the uh, pertinent information and, and set up a chart and then I meet with the sellers. They have a copy of all the contracts, but we concentrate on the chart showing this one versus this one versus this one. The and numbers. what are the benefits? It's all about yep. the numbers and the bottom line. Yep. And there are so many variations. But in the market we're in, 
uh, although it is changing, really, it is really changing. The last two contracts I had, uh, financing appraisal and appraisal contingency, and uh, but for months and months and months, we have clean contracts coming in with nothing, and uh, except the little squares checked off that appraisers do have to have access to the home. Right. Because if you're getting a loan, you must have an appraisal, but there's no contingency. Right. So if the home does not appraise, of course, the buyers have to come up with the difference. Although now, with these huge differences of two and three hundred thousand dollars sometimes there is a different financing available you can go to a different program i just had my buyers be short and didn't have the extra money to pay for the um, difference in the appraisal mm -hmm. we didn't have a contingency this was our 10th contract trying to get a townhouse and they finally had to waive everything to get a home Right. Look, so so let's talk about that, because some folks may not know what a clean contract is. So yeah. when you say clean contract, yeah. what you mean is... Is the price, yep. settlement date, all the terms that the seller want. Right. We try to get a quick settlement these days, which is 30 days, three or four weeks settlement. And then most of all the sellers would like a two months rent back right. because they need to move and right. they need to schedule the movers. They can't be out in 30 days. And for competition, the buyers are writing free rent back. So right. essentially, everything is done. You sign the contract that night, your house is sold. And the only person that has to come back in would be that appraiser right. to take a look. Um, and then you're basically done, which, it, of course, um, is awesome. Right. Unless there's an HOA. Then you have yeah. the HOA because well, you right, can't right. wave that. But as far as coming into the home, right. nobody's coming into the home. Right. 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 So now, that's a clean contract. So right. a clean contract basically means... No not, contingencies, right. you're not doing a home inspection, there's no financing, blah, blah, blah. The only thing you would have is an HOA if yeah. there is an HOA. Unfortunately, we, we have a situation with our wonderful uh, uh, veterans. When they buy, they use their VA loan right. and FHA loans for first-time buyers. You cannot waive the appraisal on these loans. And when there are multiple contracts then nine out of 10 times the seller will not take a VA contract because right. of the contingency. Right. And they take a so-called clean contract with nothing in it, I'm done, I don't have to worry about anything. And uh, it makes it very, very hard for our veterans. Mm -hmm. And um, But that's turning around and things will be, uh, you know, they'll be better and uh, for them. Right. Yeah. So in a more normal market, Right. So now let's talk about where where we think things are going, where yeah. we're going to start to see contracts with with the typical contingencies, yeah. right? Prototypically, you would have. Home so if I'm yeah, if I'm representing a buyer, yeah. I want to have a home inspection yeah. contingency. An, I want to have a financing contingency and an appraisal contingency. Yeah. So let's got. Uh, uh, did I leave anything out? That would be prototypical. That's what it is. Yeah, because yeah. a termite is not a contingency. Right. And, um, and home inspection, we have two choices. You can show the seller your willingness to really work with them and not nickel and dime them, as we say. You have an option for negotiating uh, deficiencies. Right. Or you have an option to void the contract. Right. And voiding the contract says we're really going to take care of everything unless there's a serious problem. Right. Now, and that happened to me. Uh, about six or eight months ago, we had a really serious problem. And no matter, and once you have this problem, you have to disclose. Let's right. say they don't want to contribute to fixing it. Right. You list them, you sell it again, and you now have to disclose a deficiency. So right. a seller might as well deal with it with the first contract they get. Right. So let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So home inspection contingency, when you're writing the contract, yeah. you have two choices. You can check yes home inspection yeah. or there's another box you can check where you're doing a home inspection but you retain the option to void so the yeah. second check box yeah. is you're not going to ask the seller to make any repairs right. and that's where you talk about the nickel and diamond you're not yeah. going to do it the first option 
you're doing the home inspection and the buyer has the right to come back and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, would you please fix these yeah. 15 things? And yeah. then you can negotiate again. You, you basically negotiate. have a second round of negotiating. And, and don't forget, you actually also can void the contract yes. on that first uh, exactly. check off. And on the so, second option, you're yeah. just telling the seller, hey, I'm not going to come back and renegotiate anything. Yeah. But if there's a major problem or any problem or I want to void for any reason, yeah. I retain the right to void. Yeah. Right. So those yeah. are the two. Yeah. So when you have this 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 problem that that comes up in a house, even if the seller, I mean, even if the buyer and the seller have agreed to go with option two, if a big major problem comes up yeah. and the buyer wants to walk, you're saying hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you should probably fix this anyway because you're going to have to now disclose it. You're yep. going to have to deal with it yep. in, in the future. You might as well bite the bullet. And now you're in a situation where the buyers love the house. Right. Um, but maybe they don't have the $50,000 for the repair. As an example, a uh, stucco problem. That's yes. what I ran into. And it was a $75,000 repair. Right. And... Um, and the buyers had paid well over the list price. Yes. So absolutely, my seller said, we'll take care of it. Yeah. But sometimes you negotiate. Let's say it's uh, all the uh, utilities, like the heating and cooling systems are original. They're about to die. Mm -hmm. And it's going to cost $30,000 to get new ones. Right. And the buyers could say, we love the house. We really want to buy it. But we feel like we don't have the 30000 and we feel like it should be in better condition for the price. Right. Would you split it with us and give us a $15,000 credit toward new systems? Mm -hmm. And then that seller can choose to say yes or no. Right. And most of the time the seller will negotiate because they don't want to lose the deal. Right, right. Yeah. yeah and, you know, the interesting thing is in a, in a more normal market, a, a, a buyer always feels like they overpaid for the house mm -hmm. and a seller always feels like they could have gotten a little more. Yep. You know, and it's an interesting. Nature. Yep, that's yeah, that's nature. It, it is. It's human nature. Yeah. And it and it's, uh, you know, so what happens is when you get the contract negotiated and you get into these contingency periods, people start to cool off. Yeah. And then reality sits in, yeah. and, and and this or is where they found another house they like better. Yeah, that's even worse. That is worse. Yeah, yes. <laughs> worse, worse for the seller, better oh for the buyer. Gosh. Yes, that's yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. And yeah. All these situations can happen. Exactly. We're just not in control. Exactly. Yeah. So so that's a little bit about the home inspection contingency. Yeah. So so let's talk a little bit about the. Uh, appraisal contingencies and the financing contingencies together. So, yep. um, you know, what kind of scenarios have you run into with with appraisals? Almost any type of scenario you can imagine. So first of all, you need to understand since the crisis we had in 2000, 2008, with all the foreclosures and short sales in hand because of a different type of market, of course, um, the appraisals now um, play a very, very special role. Um, they have changed the ways of doing the appraisal. In other words, there are no relationships anymore. The lender cannot communicate with the actual appraiser. Uh, it is an appraisal company that sends an appraiser out to the property. Uh, you can't request anybody specifically, so you have to make do, quote unquote, with whoever calls you and say, I'm the appraiser for the property. I've been retained to do the appraisal. There's your person, for better or worse. And we are finding that these appraisers are coming into the area from uh, far away, way up in Maryland someplace, Richmond, Fredericksburg, uh, over way over Mount Vernon, Alexandria. And as you know, appraising a property is a very fine-tuned job. Um, just knowing the area, just knowing the infrastructure and what's all around, the value of the homes, you really have to have your finger on the pulse to come in and say, yeah, this is going to appraise at that price. And uh, no, this is never going to appraise. And you can't appreciate that unless you really know. So our role is very, very special. We try as agents to find the comps that really go with the home we're selling. And then again, some appraisers say, I don't need your help. 
I don't want anything, I do my own job. That's even worse. That means they're not cooperating, they want to do their own thing, and we as agents get left really frustrated. But this is what we have to put up with. And so I always try to, um, of course, we get the email information for the appraiser. We email ahead of time all the information, all the upgrades, the floor plans, anything we have on the property. And then I meet with the appraiser when he comes to do the job. I always tell my sellers I need to sell that house twice, first to the consumer and second to the appraiser. And, and I have to do that job and I have to be there. And, um, and sometimes it's a, it's a very, very uh, fine line. It's a very difficult job. Sometimes you can't find something that goes with a home. And now you have to venture into other areas where you know the properties are. And then the appraiser will say, well, I don't, that neighborhood that's too far away, even though it's not too far away, and one rolls from one zip code to the other, 22101, 22102, and they'll have arguments about that, and yet they're within a three mile radius of where the appraisers are looking. So that is a really, really, really difficult job. And I'm sure the appraiser, him, him or herself, are finding that as well. The market has been so volatile, and they can't keep up with, with what's happening either. Right. So let's talk about a maddening scenario with with appraisals, because I've, I've had this happen several times and I know you've been through it many times. We've talked about it at dinner. So you have a house, you sell the house. Yeah. Let's say you have a house for one point eight million. Yeah. You sell the house an appraiser yeah. comes in and appraises the, the home for one point five million. And you're saying this is just not right. Yeah. It's this this home is every bit of one eight and you're yeah. you're going through your your conversation with yeah. the appraiser, which often doesn't help at that oh, point. No, and you, you can you, talk with the appraiser on unless you're in the home. Right. Well, you well, can so, call him before, you can call him after. Exactly. You can only get him or her for any conversation when you meet them at the house. That's right. the terrible thing. Well, you can you can appeal. Through the lender. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Through the lender. Exactly. So yeah. so you get this scenario and then the buyer ends up walking yeah. because the buyer and the seller can't come to terms on yeah. this three hundred thousand gap. You sell the house again, you get a second appraiser that comes in and, and everything's it's fine. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Or what do you say about that? Because for, for me, that's the most maddening thing yeah. of all, right? Because yeah. we as listing agents, we've sold the home. And now we have an appraiser who comes in who didn't understand the home, yeah. didn't understand the comps. Comes and, from another whole different area, yeah. did not understand. Well, what happens is you end up spending hours and hours, days, analyzing all this other material for comparables and then you send it in with an appeal and um and then sometimes you don't get it anyway right right yeah it's uh yeah it's about 50 yeah. 50. i think about half the time yeah. you can make some yeah. headway yeah. but if you get a three hundred thousand dollar gap between on a one eight to a one five i've never seen an appraisal come up and say oh well, yeah well okay it really is one yeah. eight they'll yeah. come up maybe a hundred thousand yeah, or 150 right. but yeah. uh it's a difficult scenario. So, yeah. so the, the the point is we have to get through the appraisal yeah. uh, contingency, and I think that you know for the most part, over the last four or five years, you know eighteen to twenty two, we haven't really had any issues with appraisals right. at right. all, right? right? Everything's because right. we're 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 in an appreciating market. So the value of the homes are going up. I think the market's changing. So now we're going to see how these appraisals come into play. And I think also most of us agents now when we get a contract, I think maybe all agents, but most of us, we do call the lender before we go through with a contract to our seller. Right. Because the sellers are going to ask, are they qualified? You know, we have to be ready to have all the answers. And talking to the loan officer, you immediately get a feel for that client. You get a feel for the enthusiasm from the lender, where they stand. They have actually done a lot more than the lender letter says. And that's another gripe I have. These lender letters can be so generic. 
and you show that to a seller and it's like wow they haven't done anything this doesn't really mean anything and right then, well you're right and then you find yep. out oh everything has been verified and we have everything it's ready to go to the underwriters and i'm questioning why are you sending that lender letter that says you have to obtain the application from the client and on and on and on that is not even true and she they will say well you know that's the what we have and i said no that's not what we can accept then send me an email and you explain in an where email we are. Yeah. where we are and with that information of course it's much easier to work with your seller to make them understand yeah and you can shorten the periods you don't have to accept the long uh periods of uh, appraisal and financing uh, i'm shortening it to 14 days on an appraisal if that's what they have Mm -hmm. and 21 days either 14 or 21 days for financing right because they can do it it turns out they can do the job but they would like to have more time so if you give them more time they just wait till the last they put you on the back burner for the time slot in doing the job mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. have found out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah yep okay so let's wrap up with the yep. financing contingency right so really what the financing contingency says at a very high level yeah. is if you don't qualify for the specified financing yeah. then you can void the contract right and that's right? why you want to have a short deadline you yeah. don't want to go down 30 days or 45 days some agents are putting 45 days in right. to find out that they really can't get the financing it's just too crazy mm -hmm. and one of the tricks not it's not it's not a trick but i guess one of the i guess it is a kind of a trick bag kind of thing is that if this if the buyer changes they're specified. So the specified financing is the financing that you specify in the contract. In the contract. Yep. So if you specify that you were going to have a 30 year fixed mortgage in the financing contingency area yep. of the contract and you switch to a 15 year arm, now you've, in a sense, voided that financing contingency. Well, if you did not get permission from the seller in writing that they understand you're changing the right. financing, then you have essentially voided your contingency. Exactly. And a lot yep. of folks don't know that. So that's no, a little tip for the buyers yep. right there that yep. are listening. Yep. Good, good, yep. good. Okay. Anything else you want to add? about this because I think you've done a great job laying yeah, it out. No, I think it's just uh, pretty much and we're going to be going back to this. Yes. Again, we've just been in this period of six months here where or maybe a year where you had to remove everything. And uh, especially home inspection is just not healthy. Right. I agree. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, Lillian, mom, Thank Thanks you. for coming in again. You're welcome. So uh, this will conclude another episode of the Go With John Show. Yeah, we'll I'm John see you Jorgensen. Next time. Go out there and build something extraordinary. Thank you. Bye. Bye. A lot of folks think that building a custom home is a complicated and arduous process. It doesn't have to be. At Stanley Martin Custom Homes, we have the process down to a science. We will bring you through the buying, design, and building phase one step at a time. Head on over to webuildonyourlot.com and check us out. Reach out to us if you want to get started on the path to your very own Stanley Martin Custom Home.